average human when it comes to self-treatment of pain. The theory of this presentation is that pain circuits and processing are largely lateralized to the right hemisphere. And also that people can fundamentally change these neural circuits through, through your lifestyle changes. And the way you live your life. The first study I'm going to talk to you about is a thermal stimulation study. It involved 15 subjects. Before the experiment, two adjacent triangles were drawn on both uh, tops of the hands, okay? That's innervated by the radial nerve, which runs along the inside of your hands. Now, if you ever hit your funny bone, that's the ulnar nerve, which runs right on the outside of your hands, which gives sensation to your pinky, your ring finger, and a little bit of your middle finger, as I understand it. And the radial nerve runs along the inside, which gives sensation to your thumb and your index finger. Now, so the rectangles are drawn on the tops, probably right around here. Each trial began with a visual fixation cross, so the participants were just sitting down in this chair, this uh, magnetic encephalography machine, getting their brain uh, activity recorded, looking for out alpha oscillations between eight and 12 hertz. After a random interval of two to six seconds, painful laser stimulus was applied to one of the two hands. Now, for any of you that are interested in physics, it will be very interesting. Both the lasers had a wavelength of 1,960 nanometers, with a pulse duration of one millisecond, and a spot diameter of approximately five millimeters. Stimulus energy was kept at a constant 540 millijoules, and as I understand, that's not that much power, which evoked a slight, moderate pinprick-like sensation, so kind of like you're getting like stabbed a little bit. If you imagine this, you're sitting, you're sitting in this chair, and they have the hands outstretched as far away from the visual field as possible, with two assistants sitting on either side of the participant and those assistants were both holding lasers, getting information through earphones from other scientists in another room, telling them when and where to stimulate the patient. Pretty, pretty intense. The results of this, uh, of this experiment was that alpha activity was lower over the primary areas, contralateral to the hand that was intended. So if they stimulated the left hand, they found that alpha activity in the right hemisphere, in the, over the somatosensory area, was lower. Now, whether or not the lateralization is because of an ipsilateral increase, a contralateral decrease, or a combination of both couldn't be determined. It is interesting to note that post-stimulus alpha activity, in contrast, was reduced over widespread areas. So this is pretty much pointing to the fact that their brains were ready and waiting for more pain after the experiment. Like they were pumped up, ready to go, anticipating more pain. It's also interesting to note that 14 out of 15 of these subjects were right-handed, and they were more successful in locating the stimuli applied to the right hand. So per perhaps this reflects some kind of perceptual superiority towards the right side of the body because they're right-handed. Maybe there's a, the neurons are a little bit stronger, the connections in the right hand. And this is just a picture of uh, alpha, an alpha wave between 8 and 12. So I'm going to talk a little bit about insulolateral. The insula is an essential brain region for integration of interoceptive information, so the sense of the physiological state of the body, uh, pain, temperature, pressure, things like that. And this is a pretty good picture that I found of the insula right here. Um, you can see <coughs> it runs pretty much inside the lateral sulcus, so you can separate the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. You'll find it in there. It's composed of five to six gyri. I enjoy reading meta-analysis sometimes because they take a bunch of studies and they find the correlations in the pop and the common denominators of all of them and try to filter out, you know, useful information. So this analysis involved 143 studies, which included 2,721 participants, about 51% female, median age was about 27.4, and they found that positive stimuli activated the left anterior and mid low more than their counterparts on the right side, which gives a little bit of evidence to my theory saying that if positive stimuli is activated on the left, then negative I would assume would be activated on the right. And the results also suggest a posterior to anterior processing scheme where information is represented in the posterior insula and more complex processing is achieved in the anterior regions. There's also some gender differences in this. Females activated the left and major level more than males. This supports what we talked about in class a couple weeks ago, how when men are presented with some kind of negative emotional stimuli, the right and make it less activated and we're more likely to either fight or, fl or, fl or flight or run away from the negative thing as opposed to 
females who would like to talk about the situation and work it out and communicate. Now, in females, the activation to, in response to emotional stimuli was localized to the bilateral anterior insula in comparison to males, which activated the left anterior and mid insula and the right posterior insula, which to me, I mean, it's kind of confusing because the females seem to have um, a more structured a more structured version of the insula where both the anterior parts are, are working together as opposed to the males, we got like the front and the back on either side of the figure. I don't know what that says about us. But, uh, the, the posterior insula was left dominant for females and right dominant for males. Additionally, females showed a greater activation than males in the hippocampus, in the left hip hippocampus, irrespective of the stimulus valence, which suggests a greater capacity for women to remember emotional events. And I can just tell you from my own anecdotal evidence, my own case study evidence of myself, but this is definitely true. It seems that the women that I know seem to remember emotional events more so than the men. Trace elements. Now trace elements are just a group of essential metals and metalloids necessary for life. The three I'm going to talk about today are zinc, magnesium, and copper, represented here. Research has investigated the relationship between these elements and in relation to pain and perception. Yet, they're not really used as medical treatments despite ease of administration and cheap availability. Keep that in mind, I'll come back to that in a little bit. The study I looked at involved mouses, it was a mouse model, and they had two types of tests, a hot plate test and a tail plate test. For the tail plate test, they would apply heat to the lower one-third of the rat's tail for maximum latency of 15 seconds because they didn't want to you know, hurt the rats too much. Uh, the test was performed at 15, 30 minutes, 45, an hour of administration, and set elements. For the hot plate test, the temperature ranged around 54 degrees Celsius plus or minus half a degree. And they would just set the, you know, the wraps on a hot plate and observe any kind of behavioral signs of no perception. So the mouse looking at its hind paw or vocalization, some type of behavior response that would elicit the mouse to be in pain. With a cutoff time again of you know, 30 seconds because they don't want to hurt the rats. the results. After injection, all of the tested trace elements induced various degrees of antinoceptive effects. Zinc, 4 to 25%, magnesium, 30 to 72%, and copper, 24 to 28%, which is pretty significant. Zinc and magnesium are both thought to cross the blood-brain barrier and perhaps act like neurotransmitters, which I think is incredibly important to have single little elements like this act so importantly like neurotransmitters. There's a lot of therapy Gross and his colleagues also showed that the zinc ion can open KATP channels in pancreatic cells, acting on both sides of the cell membrane. Now, I'm not, no, I'm not a biology expert, but as I understand it, being able to act on both sides of the cell membrane is a pretty unique property to have. Copper's mechanisms are less understood, but Jacka and his colleagues found that anti, there's antinoceptive anti effects of copper in rats with inflammatory arthritis which may point to the fact that copper has some anti-inflammatory This is the last and the most important study in my opinion that I found. Cortical thickness in Zen meditators. There were 17 meditators and 18 control subjects. Therm thermal stimulation was produced by a 9 centimeter squared contact probe, and each stimulation consisted of a 2 second ascending ramp from 34 degrees Celsius with a 4 second plateau at the target temperature and then with a two second descending ramp back to 34 degrees. And the maximum temperature that they could reach would be 53 degrees Celsius. It's important to note that all the stimuli were applied to the inner surface of the left calf, remember that. And the moderate pain was assessed on a zero to 10 scale, rated as a six to seven. Also MRI was performed during this procedure. So the results of this, very interesting. The Zen meditators average 50 degrees Celsius versus the controls, which average 48 degrees to report moderate pain. But it gets even more interesting. Five of the 17 Zen meditators reached the limit of 53 degrees Celsius in the study. In contrast, only two of the 18 control subjects could even surpass 50 degrees. So there's a ceiling effect here going on, you guys. We don't even know how strong these meditators really are. We don't know what their limits are, their pain thresholds, because of the limits of this study. The control subjects couldn't even get past the limits, but like I said, five of the 17 reached the limits of the study. 
So sensitivity was inversely related to cortical thickness in the right dorsal anterior cingular cortex, the right anterior insula, and bilateral hippocampal formation. Within meditators, correlation, there's a correlation between using experience and practice and thickness. Cell size, neurosynaptogenesis, changes in interstitial fluid, you know, cellular fluid. Results suggest that cortical thickness will increase with sustained practice. So the more you do it, the better you get, you know. And note that the thickening is a very subtle effect. It's not like your brains are just growing and getting super, super large. The changes that are taking place, you guys, are on such a tiny level, cellular, even below the subcellular level. So being able to Quantify these changes is very difficult. Now, it has been thought that the meditative posture itself could be responsible for the cortical thickening in the somatosensory cortex. Because the way you sit when you meditate is kind of awkward po posture on your legs. So some people would say that that would correlate with you know, the brain changing because of the way you're sitting. But this is false because the MRI results showed a significant increase in thickness in the right somatosensory cortex for the hand region. The hands themselves are not put in any awkward stance, any awkward posture during meditation. So there's something else going on that doesn't have to do with the posture itself. Also correlated with hours of the meditation experience. And the results of the study possibly reflect increased attentional control or decreased emotional reactivity through learned training. So guys, we can you know train ourselves to not react to negativity, to not react to negative emotional stimuli. We can just if we can learn to just filter out all the negativity in our lives and just absorb the positive, I think we'd all live better, better lives with you know, higher quality of life. So the conclusions were that current research points to a slight lateralization in the right hemisphere in regards to physical pain and sensitivity, namely the right dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and the right anterior insula, and that positive and negative emotion processing seem to be located in various regions throughout the brain in both and gender also appears to play a role in cerebral anatomy. I just talked about this with the women, because you know, with the amygdala, they activate more the left amygdala than men who activate the right. And trace elements seem to have a strong potential to be therapeutic uh, agents in self-healing. Perhaps through our diet, you guys, all the elements that I just talked about, we can get through the foods, through the foods that we eat in our diet on a daily basis. So if we start eating right, we can give ourselves these neurotransmitters or whatever, these pain modulators, and we can heal ourselves. Instead of having you know, to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on medication and going to visit doctors and hospitals and all these things, we can just change it through our own lifestyle changes. And meditation also appears to have a positive effect in pain modulation, with cortical thickness associated with hours of experience. So once again, there's another way that you can literally change the function of your brain and the anatomy of your brain through your own actions, instead of spending Certain Future research that can be done on this topic? Well, trace elements could, you know, we could do more studies with trace elements and actually maybe do them on humans. But I'm not sure that, you know, pharmaceutical industries would want to do that. If we can find pain modulators that are just elements that are these simple little atoms, then we wouldn't need so many of these complicated drugs with these molecular structures that are so incredibly complicated and, and huge as opposed to just a one little element that can do the same thing for fraction of the cost with way less side effects. Also, I'd like to do research on music's effect on pain processing. So if you listen to a song that you really like, would that make you perceive, you know, like, like a, the thermal stimulation, would you perceive that as being more painful or less painful when listening to good music? And lastly, gray regions associated with visual processing of pain and the sub subjectivity of pain. So when you're looking at yourself, if you're getting, you know, this thermal 